In this short video, we're going to begin our discussion of next generation sequencing workflows on the bioinformatics side. And we're going to concentrate specifically on RNA-seq for this video. So before we get into the bioinformatics analysis side of things, let's make sure we're all on the same page. We all know uh, where we're coming from and going to and go right back to the beginning with the kind of absolute basics of RNA sequencing. So bear with me for a moment, please. And let's imagine we have a bunch of normal cells shown here and a bunch of mutated cells, or you know, if you prefer drug treated and control or disease state and non-disease state, whatever. But we're, we're interested in what is different between these two sets of cells that underlies their different behavior. So we uh, want to know why they behave differently. In particular, we want to know, you know what are the genetic mechanisms that is causing this difference. Now, one way to address this is to examine differences in gene expression via a technique like RNA sequencing. Now, obviously, each cell, if they're human, and you know, let's say assume they're human in our, in our example here, they have a bunch of chromosomes, and each chromosome has a bunch of genes shown schematically here with my you know, expert drawing here is gene one, gene two, and gene three here along the, along the uh, DNA. And now some of these genes are gonna be more active than others. With messenger RNA transcripts uh, from some of these genes uh, that are more than in others and I'm showing those with these squiggly lines here. So for example in this case gene 3 is the most active here and gene 2 actually is not active at all in, in, in this example. So what high throughput sequencing analysis aims to tell us here is which genes are active and how much they're transcribed. Okay. And in our case, we'll use RNA-seq, of course, to measure gene expression in the normal cells. And if we're good, we'll you know, have replicates and, and do it multiple times and use uh, consistent approaches to compare across them. But in essence, what we're doing is we're going to use it on our normal cells, and we're going to do it on the same uh, thing on our mutated cells. And we'll do it multiple times, and we'll see if there are differences. Right? We're then going to compare these two cell types to figure out what's different in the mutated cells. So in this case, you know, in our schematic case here, differences are apparent for gene two, where it goes from you know, not active uh, to actually very active in the mutated form. And then to a lesser extent, differences are evident for gene three. You know, it's slightly less active in mutated cells here, whereas gene one, there's no significant difference in this example. So this kind of analysis is done in three main steps. We've obviously got the experiment, right? We've got to prepare our sequencing library and we're looking at transcripts, RNA, but we're doing DNA sequencing, so we're obviously going to have to convert it to cDNA here with reverse transcription. Then we've got the sequencing, and it's going to be the same as it ever is. We're going to use the same techniques, the same machines that we discussed in our previous videos to do our DNA sequencing. There'll be different kits, different adapters, uh, depending on the experiment you're doing, but we're going to do essentially the same thing. This is not the challenge any longer. The challenge is the third step, right? This is often the bottleneck because sequencing has got so, uh, so inexpensive and so rapid, the major bottleneck is going to be the analysis. That's going to be where we're going to have to you know, ex expand brain energy here and actual effort. So in our hands-on session for this course segment, we're actually going to do this initial bioinformatics step three analysis here using a platform called Galaxy. I'm showing an example here in the, in the window behind me. I'll actually distribute to you a unique IP address, a little address of a, of a brand new computer on the internet that will be unique for each student, that will give you a brand new Galaxy server that you can log into through a web page, much like the one behind me. Now, underneath this web page are tons of Bioinformatics command line tools that have been installed for you that we would normally run at the Unix command line prompt, it's kind of the old school way, typing at a console. Now, we're specifically using Galaxy here in this first section in Genomics 1 here because we don't want to get waylaid or distracted by the technicalities of installing these different command line tools and then running them at the command line prompt. Uh, we want to actually focus on how we use these tools to do real work, to do real analysis of real data sets like the one we're going to analyze in this week's session. So we're going to let Galaxy take care of those technicalities for us and we're going to uh, look at the overall workflow and look at the inputs and the outputs and what they look like. And this is a much more productive way to start and proceed uh, in, in my view. Now, 
of course, the side note here is as we progress and as we eventually start to do you know, custom bespoke analysis that's specific to our nitty gritty of our research project in the lab, for example, we are going to probably have to turn to the command line. And we'll do that together in a future course segment, of course. But for now, let's focus in on using Galaxy to learn the overall flow. This is going to be very helpful for when we turn to the command line later. So in our hands-on session, what we're actually going to get to uh, at the end of this week is a count data, what's called a count data, a data matrix, something like the one shown here. In other words, we'll have taken the raw reads from our sequencer, done some quality control, and then mapped and aligned them to a reference genome. We're going to take human data, so we're going to map it to the uh, human genome here, and then we're going to count them up. Uh, the reads per gene in each sample to arrive at a table like this one, where we have genes down the rows here and the different columns or the different conditions, for example. Basically, what we're doing is we're counting up these blue and red squiggly lines in our little schematic uh, that we had before and shown here below. Now, the main task for this hands-on section is actually the mapping or uh, the alignment. If you had to pick one main task, that's the one that we'll focus in on. Now, Mapping, what is this? It's often referred to as alignment because we you know, we map back to a reference genome or we align these reads back to the reference genome. Although, as we'll discuss in an upcoming class, we don't actually have to use an alignment methods. We can use alignment-free methods with some of the more modern software approaches. But in essence, what this does is it takes those short reads produced from the sequencer, as I'm shown here, and maps them back using a reference genome as a guide much like a jigsaw puzzle, right, where we've got the box with the picture on it to guide us. And then, uh, you know, the alternative here is so-called de novo assembly, where we build larger uh, contigs and, and chromosome segments with how to reference. It's a much more challenging task and something we'll talk about in a different course uh, segment. What our hands-on section is going to look like is we'll start with FASTQ files, right? We're going to have paired end data. We'll talk about what that means, but we sequence from both ends of our uh, fragmented DNA here that we're, or cDNA that we're going to look at. So we have uh, two FASTQ files that come from our sequencer. We'll talk about the format and, uh, and what it means and how it's presented. And we'll take that along with any replicates that we might have and do quality control on it. We're going to use a, a tool called FASTQC, one of the most straightforward and easily accessible of those tools. Then when we're happy with the quality of those reads, we're going to go on to do our mapping to a reference genome. We're going to get a reference genome from UCSC, um, and we're going to use uh, Top Hat 2, one of the older uh, alignment methods. Uh, there are more modern alignment methods that we can try too that are installed on these Galaxy servers that we can try out, these alignment-free approaches. We're going to focus first on Top Hat 2 to see what it gives us, and then we're going to go and actually do the counting. That's the easy step, actually, is the uh, third step where we take um, annotation file, it's so-called GTF file, that has our gene boundaries in it, and count up what we've got per gene to arrive at our count data. And we're uh, you know, virtually done at this stage, at this uh, section of the class, but the question remains, you know, now what? What are we going to do with this count matrix? Okay, uh, so we'll have data like this, just to remember, I, I showed you this before, this is our count data that we're going to arrive at, and again, it's you know, each row is a gene, each column is one of these conditions. And step one of analyzing data like this, it's always the same. We're going to plot the data. We're going to suck on it, see what it tastes like, see if it tastes bad, or see if there's something juicy in there to get our teeth stuck into that we'd want to delve into deeper and do a more formal analysis of this data. How are we going to do that? Well, you know, plotting the data, if there were only two genes, for example, it would be easy. Then we would just plot one gene against the other, right? We just replace the gene names with X and Y here and use them as our axis, something like this, right? The gene one and gene two here, we have 30 for sample one and 24 for Y in sample one. So we can take those and put our point. This is sample one. We do the same for the other samples and we could look if there are any commonalities and where these points lie, for example. But obviously we can't really do this, right? We have 20,000 odd genes. And we'd go mad trying to make a 20,000 axis plot or dimensional plot. So we use principal component analysis or TSNI or UMAP or something like it. Some of these multi-dimensional analysis methods to make sense of this data. 
and reduce the number of axes we have to consider, the number of dimensions that we have to look in to display important aspects, the essential features of our data. So we've done this already, right? It's the last section of our class. This is a PCI plot from a real RNA-seq experiment. We actually analyzed this last day, last, last week. The wild type, the WT samples are the normal, the KO are the knockdown samples here are the mutated samples. And we saw last time that it did a really good job. PCA captured over 90% of the original variants in the data and all those genes and all those samples was captured in these two dimensions of PC1 and PC2. And it tells us here because we can clearly see that the wild type are over on one side and the knockout, the red ones are over on the other side, that they're clearly and consistently distinct, right? They're different. And that's a good thing, right? That's that's often a necessary uh, but you know insufficient condition for digging in deeper. You know, doing differential expression analysis now with the tools uh, like R and DC2. That's going to be the subject of next um, our next course segment, doing the differential expression analysis and pathway analysis to look at which genes are significantly different and what pathways do they affect to really get us back to the cell biology and the biochemistry and the mechanisms that could underlie these differences. And that's the subject for our next uh, course segment. So to kind of finish off here, plotting the data, of course, is going to tell us two main things. It's going to tell us if we can expect to find some interesting differences that are consistent or and or and or let's say it could tell us, you know, there's maybe some uh, of our data points that we want to look at closer. Maybe they want to exclude them or we want to figure out if something went wrong. If there's an outlier, for example, if one of our examples was very distinct and driving a lot of that variance uh, and, and distinct from others, we might want to figure out why that was. So we are going to uh, go through this whole analysis uh, set up here in our hands-on session using Galaxy. And then this last step, our missing step this week, will be our differential expression analysis. We've actually pushed that to our next course segment where we'll talk about the model that underlies this and the statistics and the kind of graphics that we use to display these results when we go to analyze this data and publish our papers and do all that good stuff. Okay, so I'm going to end this uh, video here. I would invite you, of course, to join me uh, next time in our hands-on session and our live cast over on YouTube Live where we start using Galaxy together and going through this.